1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. This is God's word, eternally true. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago, and God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of debt, dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Here ends our reading. There's a response of thankfulness printed for you there in your bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. This sermon this morning is in a couple of parts. Um, there's what Peter's really talking about, which we'll, which we'll get to next week. And then there's all this background stuff that Peter brings up to make his point. And that's what we're talking about this afternoon. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. If you look in a, a book at uh, the Christian bookstore on difficult Bible passages, this will be one of the passages that comes up. And a lot of people have said a lot of zany stuff about this passage here. Uh, so we'll talk about these things. And it's a passage that's very gospel rich. It's a passage that speaks of Jesus and what he's done for us and uh, why we can rejoice, why we can rejoice in him. Uh, I've entitled this sermon, Jesus and Noah. We're talking about the, the parallels here between Jesus and Noah. And, and Peter brings up Noah as an example of what Jesus has done for us. And then as we talk next week about why we can have a confidence as we live today based on what we've seen uh, with Noah here as an example and what Jesus has done for us. But if you're a little bit older, not tremendously older, you know that the, the Saints didn't always have Drew Brees as their quarterback. Uh, if you're a little bit older, you know that the Saints in the 70s were called what? The Aints. Because the Saints couldn't win. And despite Peyton Manning winning two Super Bowls and Eli Manning winning two, two Super Bowls, Archie Manning, their dad, was the quarterback for the Saints and he could barely win a game. This is not that he's a bad guy, but uh, people had paper bags over their heads watching the Saints games in New Orleans with little holes through them to communicate how embarrassed they were to be there rooting for the New Orleans Saints. Suppose you were a player in the 70s in the NFL, and you had been drafted to play for the Saints, the Aints, and you weren't winning hardly any games back then. And you had the opportunity, and the Saints came to you, and the Cowboys came to you, or perhaps the Pittsburgh Steelers came to you, or the, or the Miami Dolphins, if you're earlier in the 70s there. And they said, you can play for us. If you also know NFL football in the 70s, those were the three major teams. Sorry if I've slighted anybody. I was a Vikings fan, but we couldn't win four Super Bowls in the 70s. Uh, but the Cowboys would win, and the Steelers would win, and, and the Dolphins would win Super Bowls during the 70s. But suppose you were a player and you had the opportunity to cast your lot in with the Steelers or the Cowboys or the Dolphins during the 70s. Or you could stay with the Saints. Well, if you were smart, if you didn't like New Orleans a lot at least, you would go to one of those other teams. You would uh, pick up, you'd move all your stuff, and you'd move your family to one of those other cities so that you could play for someone who would survive games with wins. This passage talks about Noah and a decision that faced people of Noah's day. And it was a decision that we can look at with spiritual eyes and with spiritual ears and see to be a decision not too unlike deciding to play for the Steelers instead of the Saints in the 1970s. And so as we talk about this, you, there are some blanks in an outline you have with you there. 
Uh, feel free to fill out this outline as we go through, or if you just want to listen, that's okay too. Whichever way you prefer, whichever way you learn better is great. Uh, but this is about Jesus and Noah. So our first blank there is Noah. Noah. Noah, Jesus, salvation, the flood, final judgment, and baptism. This is what this sermon is about. And this, these are things that Peter throws out there for us to make a point that fits in with the overall point of the letter he's writing, but that are worth us stopping for a while and are just really rich, wonderful things here for us to understand. I, I first of all, had this as a, um, a titled A Few Rabbit Trails, point number one, A Few Rabbit Trails. But these aren't really rabbit trails. They're, they're wonderful things for us to be looking at. When I was in um, one of my preaching classes in seminary with Steve Brown, he talked about sometimes you'll come ac across passages where you've just got things that people are thinking about. What's that mean? What, who are these people in prison? And how is Jesus preaching? And does baptism save you really? And you're going to have to deal with those things because people are going to be wondering about them. And those are rabbit trails. And just deal with those things at the front of your sermon and then get on with things. But we're going to deal with those things. And that's going to be the sermon here. And then we'll, we'll get on to Peter's point using these things next, next week. So the first thing that Peter wants us to see here is this. Number one in your outline, Jesus is eternal. We need to understand that to understand what Peter's talking about here. It'll also give us confidence, and we'll talk about that more next week. But to understand what Peter's saying here, we need to understand that Jesus is eternal. Jesus didn't begin in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He didn't start then in 0 AD uh, or probably more like 6 or 4 uh, BC as we look back at that. He didn't start then. Jesus is eternal. And so uh, we, we look here that he, next blanks here for you, Jesus is eternal and by the Holy Spirit spoke through Old Testament prophets. Jesus is eternal and spoke through the Old Testament prophets. Okay? And as he did also through Noah. We have Old Testament prophets who are what we call writing prophets. They wrote a book in the Old Testament, and so we call them a prophet. People like Isaiah or, or Micah or Jeremiah. But there were other prophets in the Old Testament who just spoke. People like Elijah. There's no book of Elijah or Elisha. And there were other people who spoke to God's people. And those people were prophets. And Noah was a type of prophet. And he spoke. And so Jesus was alive during their day. He wasn't on the earth. He wasn't incarnated yet. But Jesus is eternal God. He's the Holy Spirit. He's eternal God. And we see that, that Jesus... Uh, and Colossians 1 and 2, everything that's been created, he's created. John 1, everything that's been created, Jesus created. Genesis 1 as well, we see the Spirit was hovering over the face of the earth when God was creating. So the Father, crea Father has the design for creation. Jesus does the work of, the cre of creation by the agency of the Holy Spirit. But here we speak about Jesus being eternal. Jesus being eternal, and that it was Jesus, by his Spirit, speaking through Old Testament prophets. And so, Jesus was speaking through Noah. Jesus was speaking through Old Testament prophets, as we saw in what Bob read for us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Peter says there, the Spirit of Christ within the Old Testament prophets was talking about Jesus. But while they understood this in general principle, what they were talking about, they didn't know when Jesus would come or exactly what that would look like when he came and exactly what he would do. They knew he would come and he would be a king and he would suffer for his people like Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah 53. But they didn't exactly, they couldn't pinpoint it as a time and a place. And that's what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Chapter or verse, verses 10 through 12 there. So Jesus is eternal. He spoke through the Old Testament prophets and he speaks through Noah. Bob read for us from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. 
Now, if we look back in Genesis 6 through 9, where it talks about Noah, we don't see Noah speaking to a crowd there. So we don't know what this means when it says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness there in 2 Peter 2, 5. Whether Noah was preaching to people as they would gather around the ark as it was being built. Or whether the ark itself served as a, a, a monument of preaching. Judgment was coming and there was rescue for you. But Jesus was doing this. He was preaching through Noah as he did through the Old Testament prophets. Okay. So when it talks about here in this passage, if you look in 1 Peter um, 3.18 uh, or 3.19, through whom the Spirit, Jesus by the Spirit, went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those are people who were alive during Noah's day who didn't get on the ark. Now they're in hell. Their souls are in hell. Prison, as Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 2. Okay. And Jesus went and through Noah, he preached to them, be faithful to God. Follow God. That's righteousness, following God. And he spoke to these people through Noah during that day. And now these people are in prison or in, in hell. They disobeyed, going on in verse 20 there. They disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently. So Noah's a preacher of righteousness, and we're not sure how many days, how many years it took him to build this ark. But all this time, Noah was preaching, whether by word or just the ark being there. And he was preaching to them, final, or not final, judgment is coming upon the earth. But God is a Savior God who treats people with mercy. And there's an opportunity for you here to get on this boat. But you got to believe judgment's coming. If you do, you can be saved. You can get on the boat. People may make fun of you for it, like they're making fun of me. But there Jesus was, the Spirit of Christ, speaking through Noah during that day. But we read in this passage, nobody listened. Well, eight people. Eight people in total on the, on the whole earth made it on the ark. Were willing to get on the ark. Believed that judgment was coming and therefore got on the ark. And so now these souls are in hell. So that's what that, that verse there, that's what that's talking about. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Christ was speaking through him, warning people that, of the judgment to come, that they could be rescued. So that's number one. So you understand Jesus is eternal. Jesus was preaching through Noah. People had an opportunity to be saved from the great judgment that was coming upon them. So that's the first little rabbit trail for us this morning. Number two. Noah and the ark are a shadow. Noah and the ark are a shadow of the gospel. Jesus in Luke 24, in those couple of verses there, those two places in Luke 24, says the whole Old Testament is speaking of me. The whole Old Testament is speaking of the gospel. The whole Old Testament is, is showing what I'll do. Showing what I'll be. And so, whether you're looking back to Abraham or you're looking back to Adam or you're looking back to Noah or you're looking back to David, all those figures in the Old Testament are speaking of me. They show something that's true about me. And so he, he chides his own disciples there in Luke 24 after he's been resurrected and he's met up with them on the Emmaus Road. And he says, how slow can you be to understand? Moses, the law and the prophets, all have been speaking of me. And so as we see this mention of Noah here in this passage, we see that Noah is speaking of Jesus, the gospel, judgment, judgment to come. So how does Noah speak of the gospel? A in your outline, A in your outline. Men do evil. Men do evil. 
Okay, that's the first part of the gospel, right? If you have a simple gospel presentation, man is sinful and separated from God. That's law number two in the four laws. Man is sinful and separated from God. Man is sinful and deserves judgment. That's the first part of what we talk about in the gospel. And we see that in Noah. God looks down upon the earth in Genesis 6 and he's sorry, he's grieved that he's made man. And so he's going to wipe out all mankind across the earth. He's going to redo the earth. He's going to purify it with a great worldwide flood. So men do evil uh, and are deserving of, here's your second blank there in that same sentence, and are deserving of destruction. Men are evil and deserving of destruction. Noah shows us that. Jesus talks about that a lot. Jesus talks about hell more than anybody in Scripture. Okay. Men are evil and deserving of judgment. And so God brings this judgment upon the earth in, in a flood. Uh, he will bring judgment uh, uh, today upon people when he comes back. It talks about the the lake of fire, or eternal fire, eternal destruction, Matthew 25. Okay? B, in your outline there. So first part of the gospel, men do evil and are deserving of destruction. B, God is merciful and provides forgiveness for all who admit that, first of all, that he exists. That's your first blank there, exists. So God's merciful. He provides forgiveness for all who admit that he exists. Admit that they are guilty, guilty of sins, and who come, who come to him for his merciful forgiveness. Now, in this, a couple of aspects there. Number one in your outline, God provides preaching of salvation. God's merciful, and he has forgiveness waiting for people, and so he tells people about it. He provides preaching about how you can be rescued from the coming judgment. And so he does that with Noah, through Noah, a preacher of righteousness in this ark in the middle of a field somewhere being built. This huge thing. And if you've seen any kids' videos about Noah's ark or, or seen uh, uh, Russell Crowe's movie about Noah's ark or whatever it is, you know, they, they make a big deal about this. We're not sure how much abuse Noah took uh, for building this ark. Uh, but, but certainly it was a spectacle. But God provides preaching. He provides warning for people of judgment to come. So he does that through Noah, preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2.5. But he also does that today in the Great Commission. Jesus tells us, his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. Go, be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, in Samaria and to the other utter parts of the earth. And so Jesus preaches through his people today. Second thing, in addition to God providing preaching of salvation, God provides a vehicle. A vehicle, that's your blank there, number two. God provides a vehicle to be saved for those who come. He provides a vehicle to be saved for those who come. So in Noah's day, that vehicle was a boat. If you want to be saved in a physical way, as well as eternally, ultimately, get on the boat. Noah's not barring anyone from it. Get on the boat. Noah's preaching. He's preaching. Seven other people get on the boat. Um, but he provides a vehicle to be saved. It was an ark in the Old Testament times under Noah, but in our times it's Jesus. The ark is a shadow of Jesus. And the message of the gospel is get on the boat. Get on the ark. Get out of New Orleans. Go to Miami. Go to Pittsburgh. Go to Dallas. Cast your lot with those teams instead. Have faith. Believe there's a final judgment. Have faith in Jesus. He's the vehicle God provides to be saved. Uh, Peter says it this way in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Okay? 
So Jesus is that vehicle. C, in your outline there, those who admit coming judgment, that's your blank judgment, those who admit coming judgment and take God's vehicle of salvation are saved from the judgment. Okay, so Noah and the seven others, his wife, his three sons and their wives, they, they're saved. They, they take this vehicle. And today in our day, when people take the vehicle, so to speak, when they take the ark, the safety vehicle of Jesus, they're saved. But they have to admit, they have to be convinced of something, that there's coming judgment, right? If you don't believe there's coming judgment, there's nothing to be saved from. And so you don't get on the boat. If you were around during Noah's day and thought, what? I've never even seen rain before. Worldwide flood? That's crazy. That's never happened in the history of the world. That's what the people are scoffing at, at the, in 2 Peter in chapter 3. People were scoffing. Nothing's ever been seen like this since the beginning of the world where there would be something like this. But you've got to believe there's final judgment coming. If you do, you just might get on that, get on that boat. So those who admit coming judgment, take God's vehicle of salvation, are saved from the judgment. And then D, they having been rescued, are also, Peter goes on to this, are also baptized. Verse 21 in our passage here. This water, verse 21, and this water symbolizes the water of the flood, Noah's flood, symbolizes baptism. Okay? So those who, by the waters of the flood, um, those who during Noah's day get on the ark, Peter says we're baptized. Those waters sprinkling down on them in the ark were symbolic of waters that would sprinkle down upon people in Jesus' day and beyond. Rain, that's, a, that's a, well, part of the picture of baptism. Rain sprinkling down, okay? So those who have been rescued are baptized. So number one in your outline there, they were baptized in Noah's day by the waters of the flood while in the ark. That was a baptism they go through. Okay, Peter, Paul also talks about in 1 Corinthians 10 how the Red Sea was a baptism too. And you can either pass through that baptism and get to the other side and be safe, or you can be immersed by the baptism and judgment, which happened to Pharaoh's army. Um, same thing in Noah's day. Uh, those who aren't uh, 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 baptized by, by this sprinkling upon them, having taken the ark of, uh, of Noah, uh, are, are immersed in judgment. Okay. Uh, but this, is, this water symbolizes baptism by the waters of the flood while in the ark. And then number two, uh, during our day, by the waters of the sacrament of baptism. By the waters of the sacrament of baptism while in the church. Okay. So those who are rescued, those who are rescued, those who say, I'm putting my lot in with Jesus, he's my ark. He's the means of me, me making it through the flood of final judgment. Those people come for baptism in the church, the sacrament of baptism. So they believe, they get on the ark, they believe in Jesus, and they come and they're baptized. E, E, the final result for those with faith in the ark or of Jesus is salvation and new life. Final result is first blank, salvation and new life. Noah rises above his baptism. He makes it through the waters of baptism into a whole new life, right? He gets off the ark. He opens that door, puts down the ramp, and he walks into a new world. A new world cleansed of and purified of, of sin as he once saw it before. And that's what we do as believers, isn't it? Um, we rise up from our, if we had faith in Jesus, this ark. We are baptized, symbolizing this, this, this faith that we've been sprinkled clean and, and made it through the waters safely. And we come into a whole new life. 
a life where the sinful world, the sinful stuff we used to do is behind us. And that's what the New Testament and the Old Testament constantly say to us. Get all that stuff that used to be a part of your sinful life behind you. Noah's an image of this. Just as you as an individual go from being the sinful world of Noah's early days, then get on this ark of Jesus. You put your faith in being saved by Him and walk through this or ride through this baptism. Then the rest of your life is to be in this new world, this new life in Christ with your new self and putting on the righteousness of Christ and walking in a new way in the good works that God mapped out for you to do beforehand, Ephesians 2.10. And so Noah is a picture. And Noah going through this flood is a picture of your life. Pre-salvation. Salvation, getting on the ark. Baptism. And walking out in newness of life. No longer living life sinfully. Okay? Now a question. Question for you. Number three. Um, and just to state it clearly, water, water baptism, water baptism today does not save you. That's not what Peter is saying here, and that's not what he's talking about. Water baptism today does not save you. There's some denominations that say it does. You know, Catholicism says that, that when one is is baptized, that regeneration has taken place and that new life now exists in this infant child because of baptism. But that doesn't happen. Okay. Um, the Church of Christ, the disciples of Christ, believe that you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And that if you believe in Jesus and get hit by a truck and die before your water baptism, you will not be saved. Okay, Peter's not saying that. Water baptism, rather, does not save you. Um, A, note this, A in your outline, Noah is not saved by the water. Noah is not saved by the water. He's saved through the water. Or, here's your blank, despite the water. He's saved from the waters of judgment. He's not saved by water. The water was marking what was going to harm him. The water is marking judgment. And Noah is saved through it. Just like God's people under Moses came through the Red Sea, rather than meet God's judgment in the Red Sea, they get through the waters. And then the Red Sea serves as judgment on everybody else. They're immersed in it and they die. Just like during Noah's day, the, 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 the waters are not uh, uh, something that they pass through to salvation, but it's something that engulfs them and means their destruction and their judgment. So Noah is not saved by the water. It's the water he's getting away from. Noah is saved through the water or despite the judgment of the water, despite the judgment that the water is wreaking on everyone else, and here's your next blank, by getting in the ark, which took faith. Noah is not saved by, wa by the water. He's saved, in effect, the means of him being saved is his faith. He has faith, so he trusts in this ark. God has said, get in the ark and you'll be saved. And today, God says, Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. So it's not water baptism that saves us any more than it was water that saved Noah. Noah was getting saved from water, away from water, despite water. But Noah's faith, him believing God and saying, you know, Noah, build this big ark. That's as long as a football field plus the track around it. That's about how long Noah's ark was. Um, Noah's faith brings to him salvation because he trusts in this salvation that God has provided, which today for us is Jesus. 
So Noah is not saved by the water, he's saved from the water. B in your outline there, B. A Christian is not saved from final judgment by water baptism. He's not saved by water baptism, which we've spoken of, but is saved through or despite final judgment that the sacrament in part symbolizes. Did you know that about baptism? I don't usually speak about this when we baptize somebody. Um, just like circumcision meant, you're marked by God as one of his people, and if you do not follow God, you will be cut off from his people. Circumcision, cutting off. So baptism means you are either cleansed by the blood of Jesus, or you will be flooded by final judgment. Sacraments demonstrate God's blessing and cursing all in one just like the flood of Noah. See that? God's cursing and blessing all at What does God do? He floods the earth. It's cursing. And he blesses his people with an ark, Noah. What does he do? He floods, he floods Pharaoh's army. He curses Pharaoh's army with a flood around them, the Red Sea. But he blesses his people, bringing them through it. The Lord's Supper. The curse of God is demonstrated. This happened to Jesus, and this will happen to every sinner, we're all sinners, who doesn't have faith in Jesus. Your body will be punished for the sin you've done. Your blood will be spilled, you yourself, if you don't believe in Jesus. This will happen to you for eternity unless you let Jesus' blood and, and body count for you through faith. See, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is God's cursing and His blessing all tied together. The Lord's Supper means we're blessed because Jesus was cursed for us. Baptism means we're blessed. We're cleansed of our sins. We're sprinkled like Noah. We're in the ark and we're sprinkled. We've just got rainwater on top of us. We're not being doused. We're not being immersed. We're not being flooded. We're not being drowned by the water of final judgment. And that's why baptism is not something we do for people who call me up and say, hey, I've just had a kid. Uh, can I have him baptized in your church? And those parents, neither one of them have faith in Jesus. Because when you take the sacrament, whether it's the Lord's Supper or whether it's baptism, you're pronouncing upon yourself and what's being pronounced upon the receiver of the sacrament, this person will be blessed by the blessings contained in the, the, the depiction in this sacrament or they will receive the curses if they do not follow up this sacrament with faith. And so to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, to take it without faith, brings condemnation upon yourself, which Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. Or being baptized without faith in Jesus brings, brings judgment upon oneself. So what do we do with infants and baptizing infants? It's a dreadful thing we do when we baptize infants. We baptize infants not believing that that brings them eternal life. It doesn't bring them regeneration. But just like circumcision, what it does for them is it says, I've got a responsibility as a parent to provide for this kid that a, a, a surrounding in which he will see the gospel and believe. Or else the curses of this sacrament, baptism, will come upon this child. He'll be a victim of final judgment, like the people during Noah's day who didn't get on the ark. Instead of being one who was blessed, by that judgment during Noah's day. You see how Noah was blessed. He got out of the ark and he didn't have to put up with all those violent people anymore. And when we baptize kids, it's just like uh, uh, Israelites in the Old Testament times. When they circumcised their eight-day-old kids, they were taking on the responsibility as parents that their kid may receive the curses of the covenant if their kid did not follow up that's circumcision with faith. And this is why God in the Old Testament, through the prophets, through Moses, tells his people, through Jeremiah, tells his people, circumcise your hearts. 
This is why Paul in Galatians says, circumcision doesn't matter. Faith does. Have the circumcision of faith. Circumcise your hearts. Circumcision only only, uh, uh, symbolizes something. That you're either marked as one of God's people or you'll be cut off from God's people. Baptism only symbolizes something. That your sins are washed clean by Jesus. That you make it through the flood like Noah made it through. Or it means you'll be flooded. You'll be drowned when final judgment comes. So a Christian is not saved by water baptism. He's saved through or despite final judgment that that sacrament in part symbolizes. Final judgment is symbolized in baptism. Because baptism and Noah are connected. There's blessing for God's people in Noah's flood. Because they're saved by Noah's flood. They're saved from the sin all around them in Noah's flood. But there's cursing to those who won't get on the ark. To those who don't have faith in Jesus. So number one there, be one. Final judgment devastates everyone else. And B2, Christians are not in the ark, but are in Jesus is their hope for being saved through final judgment. And this, believing in Jesus, has taken faith. So we see this great parallel between Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and Noah, don't we? If you look back in your bulletin, the very first sentence of the declaration of the gospel. Look there on the left upper side of your bulletin, our declaration of the gospel. For it is by grace, by Jesus, by an ark, you have been saved like Noah, like you with faith from eternal condemnation. Saved how? Through faith. Noah had faith. He, got, he believed in the grace of God who was going to save him from the destruction of the whole earth, which the whole earth deserved. And this is not from yourselves. Noah didn't wake up one day and say, I should build an ark because I'm so smart. Because I deserve to be saved. No, Genesis 6, Noah just simply finds favor with God. And God says, hey, Noah, I find favor with you, and I'm going to rescue you. Build an ark. And you know what? I love your family too, so tell them about it so that they might be saved as well. And so he does. So in other words, Jesus is your ark and he will save you from final judgment, but you've had to believe this. You've had to believe that you need to get on to this ark, that you needed to enter into faith in Jesus. So Noah and the gospel would be like this. For by the ark, you've been saved through faith. That judgment was coming and that God's offer to save you was through this ark Noah was building. But for you today, it's this. For by the grace of Jesus, you have been saved through your faith in Jesus. Your faith that final judgment was coming and that God was offering to save you through Jesus. You only need to get on. You only need to believe in him. So water baptism doesn't save you, Jesus does. Just like the water didn't save Noah, the ark did. Water baptism is simply something that happens to you if you or your parents have faith in Jesus. If you or your parents believe that judgment is coming and you have faith, uh, the ark will save you, you get on the ark, then baptism happens. The rains come, in other words. Water sprinkles down upon you in that ark and you head into a new life post-baptism. That is, the water doesn't immerse you in the judgment that destroys you and it's Jesus who saves you through baptism. You're sprinkled in baptism as a result of your faith or the faith of your mom or dad if you're younger, just as Noah's sons experienced. The faith of Noah gets them on that ark and they're saved. Okay, we'll do C and D, and we'll pick up with four next week. So C in your outline here. When one is baptized, when one is baptized, salvation doesn't happen because 
of the baptism. Okay, we spoke about this just a few minutes ago. Catholics believe this, that salvation happens because of the baptism, but this is not so. Uh, just as salvation doesn't happen to Noah because of the rain. The rain doesn't cause Noah's salvation. Noah is saved from the rain. And then D, when one is baptized, rather, a proclamation of the gospel happens. The message is proclaimed that a person can make it through the flood of destruction that final judgment is. Uh, baptism proclaims, in other words, that one survives the flood of final judgment because he has Jesus, because he has this ark. He's God in the boat, therefore, and therefore he's saved. And that's what a sacrament does for us. It shows that the saved person is experiencing the blessings of this sacrament and that the unsaved will experience the curses of it. So God says to us this morning, see this link between your life and the story of Noah. Noah was told by God, he found favor, and God says to Noah, I've got a means of salvation for you. And so God provides for him this plan for the ark and gets Noah on it and even shuts the door for him. God provides for us not an ark, but something like an ark. Jesus. And Jesus declares in Luke 24, this was speaking of him. Moses, who wrote this about Noah, uh, spoke of Jesus in this way. And he says to all of us, he says to all of us, get on the ark of Jesus that we might be saved. Be grateful as we think back on our baptisms and even as we experience, like we will this morning, the Lord's Supper, that the curse that our sins deserve has fallen upon Jesus that we might experience the blessing that his suffering has earned for us.